Okay. Hello. Good afternoon, and, and welcome to the the last session uh, of our uh, public sector summit in uh, in Brussels. So, uh, just to I introduce uh, our panel uh, for this afternoon, uh, Paul Grist, who is head of our education practice for AWS and EMEA, is going to uh, chair this session. Uh, and we have two guest speakers, Cheryl Miller, who heads the Digital Leadership Institute, uh, and uh, Julia von Knoski, who also heads up career colleges. Uh, the topic for this afternoon is around We Power Tech and engaging and retaining technology uh, and talent. And we saw from the keynote uh, the amount of open positions that there are right across Europe in the ICT sector. So a very important topic, and uh, hand it over to Paul. Sasha, who's our diversity marketing officer over there, um, we're going to get her to talk about We Power Tech at the end. It's an Amazon oh, right. program. And, uh, <laughs> so she'll come over and tell us a bit about the program at the end. So, so thanks for making it to the end of the day. Uh, fantastic to see you all. Uh, and as Noel says, a, a really important issue um, that we're looking at in terms of um, matching people with, with jobs, um, finding employment, uh, and then specifically looking at the issue of diversity in the workplace. Um, so some of the questions we're going to be looking at today is, you know, how do we prioritize inclusion in technical teams? What can leaders do from cultivating the pipeline to hiring to internal strategies? And how do we make the future of tech more diverse and inclusive? Um, so um, Noel's already done the introductions, and um, we're going to kick off uh, with uh, just both the panelists saying a little bit about themselves, who they work for, and what their role is. Thank you. Shall I start? Go ahead. Okay, so... Gosh, my name is Julia von Klonowski, and I'm di Director of Digital for Career Colleges Trust. So I don't know how many people were here at the education session, so I don't want to bore you. Um, but Career Colleges operate in the 14 to 19 age group, and generally with young people who've in some way probably been let down by the education system. So they're not necessarily going to go on the normal academic track. So our role is, which career colleges kind of give you a name of, so we have a little mantra which is careers, not courses. So we try to bring young people and give them the employability skills that companies like AWS and all the other um, people who are probably here um, look for because most employers will say to you, it's not actually the qualification, that's kind of a given that we look at, it's the skills and the, the things that surround it. So what we do is we go into a, a college will actually apply to be a career college and they have to prove that in their geographical area they actually have a skills shortage. So it could be in construction, it could be in digital, there are various areas that, that we operate in. My name is Cheryl Miller. I'm the founding director of the Brussels-based Digital Leadership Institute. Um, our organization has been in operation for the past three years, but I've been active on the subject of inclusive digital transformation for nine years already. Um, and for the past two and a half years, with the support of Amazon Web Services, we've reached, in particular, girls and women in vulnerable communities in Belgium, across Europe, and even globally. Um, in the numbers of the thousands with actual digital skills. And we um, are looking really at the question of um, economic um, uh, independence for those girls and women that we're targeting uh, through what we call esteem skills. So you've all heard about STEM, I suppose, by now. Um, we add in the art, the A for art, to, to focus also on creative digital skills and the future economy. Um, and we put the E for entrepreneurship on the front, so we really advocate for um, girls and women starting their own businesses that are either tech-enabled in the first instance, but also through programs that where we're bootstrapping women into tech expert roles, um, that we're getting in them into tech-driven startup, and we're doing this on a global scale. Fantastic. So thank you both for introducing. And just to say, um, the AWS Diversity Series is part of the We Power Tech program, which um, we'll hear a little bit about at the end. Um, there is a hashtag um, for live tweeting on this, which is hashtag We Power Tech, if you want to follow. Let's do that. So Cheryl's <laughs> going to tweet live and multitask. Um, so Julia, just coming to you first, you've seen such an amazing response from students who've had minimal training or computer skills at the onset of career colleges. 
Uh, what do you think is the driving force behind their willingness to work so hard and spend so much time in the classroom? So I guess I would take it a little bit back. So by the time they often come to college, they're actually disillusioned um, and disenfranchised. And so the projects that we do with AWS are very much about trying to inspire them to want to switch back on to education, if yeah. you like. So one of the examples is the Amazon Comet Relief Project that we ran this, this year. And that's really about practically using or practically developing skills. So what tends to happen, you've all been in education, what tends to happen is you learn something, you write it down, you maybe speak it within the school, but you don't actually go outside to practice. And I don't know if you're like me, I have to do to learn. So I remember when they taught me Excel, it meant nothing until I'd actually got a reason to do it. So, so that's, um, that's kind of the, the way that we would, we would inspire them. It's absolutely fascinating to watch how little it takes to switch young people on. So the project that we ran with AWS was a nine-week project. And I know that at the start of it, nobody would have employed any of them. You know, I would walk into the classroom and they'd have their hoodies up and their headphones in and they'd be sitting, you know, normally like this and they'd have gone to sleep at four o'clock in the morning, like most um, young people that age kind of thing. But by the end of it, there wasn't a single employer and we had four employers at the final where they actually presented to 120 people um, or a few more. And there wasn't a single employer who didn't turn around and say, I'd employ every one of those. They, yeah. It was just incredible. And they left on a high. So when they left, they then go back and they talk to their parents and they talk to their, to their other students who are there and they're presenting within the colleges. So they absolutely, it's like a pyramid effect, they switch other people on. So, um, so it's about actually giving them the experience yep. of doing, I guess. Perfect. So I think we're talking about engaging, inspiring. And um, Cheryl, in your work, you also do a lot of stuff around creating an opportunity mindset, mm -hmm. right? So that the actual ability in people to see opportunity rather than be dissuaded from doing things. Can you just tell us a little bit about your approach in creating that opportunity mindset? Mm. So uh, opportunity, I think where we've kind of missed the boat is um, there is a massive, highly skilled population in the world that is female. Yep. Um, and actually the opportunity is less, I think, on the part of these women who are, who are very innovative and very motivated and uh, very resourceful. I think they're not getting the opportunities that they need and deserve. So, um, and it's kind of a, a cyclic thing. Like, you know, um, there's a lot of stereotype conditioning happening, um, losing kind of uh, traction in their careers, um, maybe exiting to around the childbirthing years and, and kind of coming back in. So there's a lot of transition um, around this uh, demographic. Uh, and then what we see is, um, so a couple of best practices, which I think people hate to hear, is we actually specifically target girls and women and anyone who identifies as a female. Um, and then the feedback that we get about creating that environment for them to learn, um, diffuse the kind of stereotypes around technology, around leadership roles around startup, um, the feedback we get is, thank you for giving us this safe space um, and a sense of community as well. You know, like I'm not out there doing this alone. Um, access to expertise, access uh, to other kinds of resources. So that's the kind of thing that we're deploying that does result in a mind shift in the individuals, um, but I think our bigger challenge is actually breaking into the structures that are outside of our organization to actually give those then talented, skilled people an opportunity to become starters, um, to have a place in tech organizations, um, and to, to develop and lead in the digital society. Yep. So. And so from Amazon's perspective, you know, we obviously uh, believe that um, we should play a much bigger role in, in the workplace and helping people to be geared for the workplace. So you both work with Amazon now. Um, can you share your insights into how um, we partner together, particularly around course development, professional development, and job internships? Mm -hmm. So um, course development, so actually making content, mm -hmm. um, the professional development piece, 
and then, and then the internship. So actually getting people into placements and opportunities when they've done the learning. So, and, and, and just and on yeah. that point, what are we doing right and what are we doing wrong as well? So to, to build on really what you were, you were talking about, I guess my area is, is um, diversity in the, the whole wide piece. So I think of diversity as equality. So what I want is that no matter whether you're female or male, LGBT, whatever you are, that you have exactly the same opportunities and that we're not, we're not working where we demonize, if you like, one group so that another can, can develop. So we have a digital girls workshop, and that's very much around one of the areas is, um, which we do with AWS, and that's very much about how do you attract girls into digital? Because we tend to push coding. We know that girls respond differently to, to things. They, they tend to respond to adjectives, um, not to, not to uh, verbs. So people are looking at rewriting job specifications. So it started by how do we attract more women, but actually what we need to do is write documents that attract both because we don't want to miss anybody, anybody yeah. out. So um, one of the things we do with the project is we make sure we mix girls and boys together because what we want them to do is to learn how to operate in the, in the workplace. So we, we don't let them choose their own groups. We put girls, so unfortunately there are fewer girls than boys, and we put those into, into the groups. And when they come into um, AWS to experience, when they look around, there are women, you know, there's some really impressive women at AWS. It's never going to be, you know, it's going to take time for, for that to happen. Um, but there are also a lot of really impressive men. And, and I know in my career, I often don't notice it's irrelevant to me, and that's what we want to develop, is a, a, an area where it doesn't matter what you are and what you look like or where you come from, but actually you have exactly the same opportunity, and those are the programs that we're running with AWS, so that your skill set and the people you're drawing skills from is a much wider skill set. Yep. And can you say a little bit more about finding placements, what kinds of things have you done to actually get people then yeah. springboard into the real world of, of work? Yeah, so work placements are, and shadowing are absolutely key. So as an example, one of the girls who was on our AWS Comet Relief project um, actually went to get some work experience at one of the other um, customers who was there. So the difficulty is for young people and for education establishments is a shortage of money. So what's important is AWS are, do things like Alexa workshops. Um, we run all kinds of different things to educate young people to make certain they're ready for careers. But that can't just be AWS. It's got to be that all of our employers out there actually get more and more involved with preparing young people and giving them the opportunity. So one of the things AWS is what we're working on there is we have something called T-levels that are going to happen in, in England. And, and part of that is a two-year course for 16 to 19 year olds, which has 45 to 90 days work experience. Now, there are going to be, I don't know, a couple of million young people who are going to need that work experience. Where are they going to get it from? So we're developing a, um, a template, if you like, AWS and career colleges, to hand to all your partners and customers of how they'll be able to in, have young people in, what are the questions, what kind of programs should they run, what kind of support's necessary to give those young people the work experience. And you will be amazed because most of you will employ them at the end of that work experience. Yeah. You know, so. just, just, just to dwell on that for one more moment. So there's the, the digital skills, if you like, the hard skills, the, the sort of business skills and soft skills. What, what have you done there that's worked around adding that extra layer of... So we, that's partly where these projects um, work because they get real experience. Um, but also we run a lot of workshops. Um, there's a lot of online materials that we use. But it's also about... So one of the things, if you become a career college student, you have to do a full day. So they have to do a full working day. So any of you who've got um, 16 to 19 year olds or any of you who've got young people at university, you know that they're... Week is probably, what, eight hours? Something like that? So one of the things, one of the students said to me when we were running the project, I don't have time to do all of this stuff. And I said, so what's your day? She said, oh, well, I have a lecture at 10, 
And then um, I have another one at four. And I said, what do you do between 10 and four? Well, I have coffee with my friends. <laughs> well, when you start work, you know, it's not like that. So they do, don't understand, unless they go into the world of work, what that, okay. what that actually is. So one of the things we insist on, which is very difficult for education institutions, is they do, they have to make certain, all their students do a full working day. Now, that's quite a move for most education institutions to to manage that, as well as doing work experience. Perfect. And Cheryl, on the, in terms of the work you've done in partnering with AWS with building content or the prof professional development or work placements, what, what's mm -hmm. worked for you and what hasn't worked? Well, you know, um, now I personally have been working on this topic for nine years, yeah. um, which means a lot of trial and error and kind of seeing, you know, what works, what doesn't. Um, and actually, I just got a, uh, recognized at the Mobile World Congress with the Global Mobile Award, Award for this work. Um, and what we've seen is, um, now we focus on kind of two communities and four um, initiatives. One is targeting young girls, um, where we're, our work is to build the community, but also to do that through flagship <coughs> events that we can kind of copy paste. So we do something called the Girl Tech Fest, which reaches two or 300 girls in one day. That's all volunteer-led, a lot of moving parts, kind of like a TEDx type of thing. Um, and linking those, the girls who are uh, reached in a larger community, like a digital a platform, to kind of keep their interest beyond just the, you know, the strategic intervention. We do um, an initiative called InCube, which is, again, a global platform promoting female tech entrepreneurship. I think it's the only kind of, uh, only one of its kind in the world. And again, through a flagship event called Move It Forward, which is a kind of hackathon slash startup weekend. But we don't call it either of those because we're tackling an audience that would not participate, who don't participate otherwise in startup weekends or, or hackathons because it just doesn't speak to them or they say, that's not for me. Um, so we work very hard on the language, on you know, how it is that we market um, these initiatives. And through the Move It Forward event, for example, we're putting AWS training on the, on the event itself. So half of the time they're actually working on skills development, um, Android app coding. We do a deep dive on a particular topic, whether it's data visualization or web VR or whatever it is. And we ask them to themselves come up with projects that respond to a social challenge that is normally disproportionately impacting girls and women. Yeah. So we've done things around cyber violence, um, with and for women refugees, women in media. Um, and what happens is you get a lot of people who would not normally participate in the startup ecosystem who are there because they care about the topic, because they want to learn those skills. Um, and we have to do everything. I mean, there has to be food, there has to be childcare, there has to be plenty of advance notice for them to block their time. Um, and around the language, we call it like a starters event. We don't call it start up. So it's also appealing at the level of the beginner. Otherwise, they think, oh, I have to be a developer, I have to, and this is not all the case. Um, and what we've done now is we've run this event, say, 13 times. We're being asked to replicate it in China and uh, Brazil, all over Europe, all over the world. And it's been specifically with AWS support. So uh, one of our colleagues, Nicola Walsh, in your Dublin office, has been activating AWS people to come with us to deploy these things all over yeah. the world. Um, and you walk away with kind of a basic understanding of the cloud, you know, deploying a, a website out there. And these kind of tech-enabled, you'd be surprised at the barriers to entry for startup when it comes to a woman that you just pick off of the street. Yep. Um, she knows she needs a website. She might need an app. And this is why she's not doing what she's doing, or she's not getting into startup. Also, no sense of community, this kind of thing. Um, and we've reached three or 400 women doing this. In a typical event in Brussels, 40 women, 26 nationalities. So we're also reaching a lot of socioeconomic backgrounds, a lot of cultural backgrounds. Um, and from that, it's become kind of an organic thing where the women themselves have been driving the replication of the footprint. 
so a uh, female tech startup. And we also, um, because I said esteem, our vision is actually uh, tech-driven startup by women. Yep. So for this, we launched Europe's first ever female tech incubator in Brussels a few months ago. Um, just to start housing some of the output of these initiatives that we're getting. And um, unfortunately, our Belgian level funding has gotten pulled. Um, thank goodness AWS is still supporting us. But we're literally at the stage where um, the women themselves are demanding to go the next step yep. in terms of mentorship, in terms of continuing going deeper into the tech, deeper into the business skills. Um, and for that, we've now launched uh, this apprenticeship program with AWS um, to really create female tech experts. And that's a whole curriculum that we ourselves have developed um, using kind of professional certifica certification programs. So the women are not doing uh, standard computer science studies. They're not going through the academic paths, and yet, 80% of women are marginalized by traditional career paths, so they're being, they're parachuting out of kind of typical employment situations, um, and we're trying to regroup them then. We're trying to grab them, put them on these like uh, short circuit, short, short trajectories through professional certification. So we just launched a, um, a cohort in Brussels in October. We have some of the participants here. 84 women joined. So when you hear people say, oh, women don't want to do tech, or they don't want to do startup, or this is absolute BS, yep. we got 84 women in the first cohort, 50 who completed the first boot camp, 25 who got their first Cisco CompTIA Plus certification, 12 of those Cisco certified trainers, yep. and another 20 of them who just finished um, an AWS um, uh, solutions architect training with Paul, your colleague right here, who literally gave of his own time to be here to train them. Yep. So we're skilling them up to be cybersecurity specialists, cloud architects, um, IoT, data, and our biggest challenge now is actually to find the organizations who want to onboard these women, mm -hmm. pay them because they can't afford not to work, yeah. and then pay us on the side to keep their training trajectory moving forward in line with what the organizations themselves want and with what the women them themselves want. Yeah. And I think this is like a win-win-win thing where you really see um, the jobs being filled, the skills being developed, and you're impacting greater diversity in the industry. Fantastic. So, so that so mentoring issue is, is key, no matter you know, what area of diversity you're from, yeah. is actually because often um, they haven't had anybody who's paid them any form of attention or praise or whatever it might be. And it's amazing how quickly you can switch somebody on just by mentoring. And that's Absolutely. not just for girls. That's, you know, that's, that's whichever area of diversity you, you sit in. Yep. Indeed. And Cheryl, you kind of hinted halfway through that, that once you see some successes, the successes start selling themselves and people, more people mm -hmm. come on the program. But how do people find your programs, both career colleges and DLI? I mean, are you having to go out and, and find people initially? Uh, you find it easy to partner with organizations to build a pipeline of people to come in? I mean, Julia, how are you, how are you inducting people into your programs? Yeah, so, so in the career colleges sense, it's often the colleges, obviously, who are enrolling them. But what we have to do is, is help them to make it interesting that young people want to take digital careers. So Simone, who's sitting over there, and I have been working really hard on how we can actually um, bring young people to um, that, you know, wanting to study digital. And, and the problem is that many of the colleges who are delivering it um, are not delivering an exciting program. So, you know, it could just be, let's take a computer apart or whatever. So what we're working on is, is content, is addressing it. So, for example, in the digital girls space, we are trying to build some role models from AWS young women yeah. um, and what are their personalities and what have they done. Mm -hmm. okay. Once we've done the young women piece, um, which will then be left with the colleges so that when they've got people coming in to enroll who may think, I'm going to do, I don't know, hairdressing or whatever it might be, um, or it might be 
fixing cars, if it's, you know, whatever, male or female, um, that actually you can start swinging them into a digital career, understanding that digital's in, in everything. But you need to show them people so that, are, that they can aspire to. Yeah. You know, so it's not people necessarily my age, because I look yeah. like I've been there, seen that. Yeah. The other thing I just wanted to say is um, diversity in some ways is also about the fact that nobody's the same. Yep. So one of the things we have to look at is if you looked at women or young men 20 years ago, they are very different, partly because of technology. So if we don't make changes and keep looking at how do we address them, which is what the Comic Relief Project was about, how do we get 16 to 24-year-olds to engage in something like that when they're not watching television anymore? Whereas my generation might watch television to get our information. In five years' time, it could well be that they're all asking Alexa, maybe a year. But if we don't modify and change the way that we address young people, so what works today will not work even in four or five years' time. And unfortunately, our education systems, which were designed, I don't know how many years ago, of course, are on the same path they need. Oh, and yeah. companies like AWS help to make those Yep. those changes by being involved. And Cheryl, you, you're, you've done a lot of work with uh, women in their 30s and 40s in particular, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and I'm guessing it's even harder for them to access learning because they're outside of the formal structure of the young mm. people that you work with, Julia. But mm. how, do, how do women find your program, or do you have to do a lot of work to go, go find them? It is a lot about persistence. I yeah. mean, and where we've, uh, so we now have a, a network of three or 4,000 women um, of all different ages. Um, but it means, I mean, what we're really <coughs> missing is, and we're extremely resourceful. We, we're one of the top startups in, in Belgium, even though we're a nonprofit with a social mission. Um, we're extremely resourceful, doing a lot of advocacy work at the top level, and this is where Brussels is very interesting. So I can, um, you know, negotiate at the Brussels region level, at the Belgian level, at the European level, even at the uh, international level. And we are doing that with commissioners and, you know, executive directors at ITU and UN Women and so forth. So we can be doing the advocacy work for the top down change and awareness building. But we also have to be doing the grassroots stuff because Absolutely. people just don't get it until you show them this is what we are doing. Yeah. Um, and we, we really need that sustained investment to replicate and scale. Yeah. Um, this is where you know, I spend probably 90% of my time talking to private sector companies, talking to uh, public sector, making applications for grants. Um, but I don't think it's really my job, ultimately. I mean, we're looking at uh, more than half of college graduates who are female, and yet, you know, only 2% in the actual market who are working in tech. Uh, so there, and, and, and then on the other hand, we see this million jobs that will go unfilled in Europe alone by 2020 if we don't get the skill sets that we need. Um, and even higher if you talk about the digital disruption. So that's 900,000 or a million jobs in the tech sector specifically. But if you add in, you know, airlines and leisure and all the stuff that the cloud is, mm. is driving, right? Any business. Um, we're talking a million and a half jobs that will go unfilled. So I kind of see it as logical, but you know, correct me if I'm wrong, um, that those jobs could very readily be filled by girls and women if we do the right marketing, because they're already going into post-secondary education. They're already going through the education system. We have that luxury in Europe. Yep. So just a bit more marketing, a bit more focus on that demographic, and specifically that demographic. So yep. nothing personal about how the college systems are going about it, but we see if you don't actually target girls and women, they don't come. So we don't, I, so I don't run a college, um, and, and exactly what you're saying is that what we do is try and persuade colleges to turn that great big ship. To focus <laughs> on that. To do that. So our, we're telling them focus specifically on that demographic because it's kind of a quick win scenario, okay. you know? And this is, I think, what we have missed out on. Now, we've innovated so many things in our little uh, crucible, and by the way, Belgium has the worst participation of girls and women in STEM in the developed world. That's OECD statistics. So we're working really in a crucible, like uh, best possible scenario. 
So we've got stuff that we are being asked to replicate and scale everywhere, and this is where we really need those global private sector and public sector partnerships just for us to be able to be delivering what we do well without the distraction because we are really making an impact wherever we go and I think a sustained um, emphasis on those approaches um, is going to be the only way actually to get those numbers that we need Perfect. collectively. So I sit on a group in the UK which is a um, CEOs called the Male Champions for Change. Okay. Um, because one of the things that we recognize is we have to do it together. So these are CEOs of large companies like AWS who are looking at their business to make certain that women have the same opportunities, that people from different backgrounds have the same opportunities, but a recognition that if we don't do it together, then we end up disenfranchising and actually um, kind of making people fed up. And, and one of the issues, I mean, you know, I have a son, I've got two grandsons. What I don't want them to grow up in, in a world where they feel disenfranchised. Mm -hmm. So it's really important that the, because women make up whatever, 51, 52% of our, our population, mm -hmm. that women have every opportunity, but we have to bring them up together to understand that they're equal. So, so Male Champions for Change works really well from that perspective, because it's about changing the way that businesses operate. Businesses were set up by men for men often. Yeah. And the kind of way you have a meeting or, or the fact that a woman needs to leave at four o'clock because she's picking the children up. But, but again, our world is changing in certain educated groups because, you know, in my case, both my son and my son-in-law do as much of the childcare as my daughter and daughter-in-law do because they come from that kind of a background. Yeah. So there are, those are the so things we want to replicate. So they'll be on the panel next time. Yeah. Right? They, well, those are the things that we want to replicate, is let's look at what works, let's look at what's not working, and we need to make, make the changes, and, and, you know, together, basically. When I look at the fact that there's not one more female tech expert in Europe since 2005, this is uh, Eurostat data, and the fact that only I mean, optimistically speaking, 10% of tech founders in Europe are female, then I think there's a kind of de facto exclusion going on. And that's the stuff that is like, uh, I mean, w there, is, there are uh, pockets of improvement, but um, I think, yeah, I, I really want us to keep an eye on that, uh, on those um, variables, on those uh, performance indicators for me. Because I think if we see a change there, um, the World Economic Forum, for example, tells us that the average group of females is more diverse than the average group of men. So by having greater participation, and it's easy to see, you know, greater female participation, we also open the discussion to greater diversity of every kind. And this I can attest to from the work that we've done. And I think it's, uh, it's a kind of obvious variable, and it's, some of the, it's kind of the canary in the coal mine, too. Yep. You know, 3% um, tech founders in Belgium are female. Yep. If, we kn if we see that number start to tick up, we know that more women are doing formal CS education, more are getting funding to do startup, more are doing informal education, potentially. And then there's a lot of other stuff, I think, that it just means the ecosystem is healthy. So that's why, um, not to detract from the, I think that the question generally is, we're working in a, in a monoculture in tech today. This um, delivers a lot of dangers of its own, lack of innovation, um, lack of accountability even to the rest of the population. So for me, watching those kind of indicators is what's going to help us to make sure that the innovation is happening, that some accountability is there. And I think ultimately that, you know, there's also this question of, are we using the tools for the betterment of society? And if half of the voices are not, you know, embedded in the direction we're choosing, in particular through cloud and all of the back end that AWS is delivering, all the AI and the you know big data and machine learning. Um, at some point, it's going to be you know the singularity and the point of no return. 
And um, we don't want to wake up five years from now going, oh shit, what did we do? Um, and that's why there's this urgency to have the diversity of voices today and short-circuiting uh, short that, you know, whatever those long-term paths are that we're just not going to get to in time. Perfect, thank you. And the last question is going to be about the future, but you've kind of taken it there with your comments. We've mm -hmm. actually got a few minutes. Um, are there any questions from the floor? One or two questions we've got time for? Or comments. Um, or comments or observations. Case studies, question there. success stories, <coughs> what we can do better and more of. We all know most CIOs are male. Yes. Uh, how do we, how do we push that harder? Uh, so I've worked in. You mentioned it last night, Julia. Over yeah. A drink that I, in the previous company I worked for, I was the only male member of the the women in technology group in the company. Yeah. Um, Bravo. A very, a very old-fashioned engineering company, large corporate, really, really, really big company. But I was the only man in yeah. the team, um, and they made me. Uh, write a white paper to go to the company uh, treasurer and the MD <laughs> to actually ask for finance to, to, to continue the group. Um, and it took me pointing out that he had two teenage girls that were just about to join the job market for him to agree to actually give us finance to go forward. Now that was an individual personal example of that, that, that person, but how do we push the CEOs so and the leaders to... So it's, it's top down, isn't it? So the very fact that the CEOs are there, but their frustration is often their own companies because trying, so for example, I won't name them, but there is one particular financial company who have brilliant um, parental leave for male, for men. But the male men are told, you can take it, but if you take it, then you won't get promoted. So what message now, women aren't told that, so they get very frustrated because they know what they want to do, but things down the line often get um, kind of, could get changed. So, and I, you know, I had a situation where there was a young man that I was dealing with who, uh, on the governor, sitting as a governor with me, who worked in construction, I think I said to you, and he wanted to join the women in construction, I think he worked for McAlpine or whoever it was, because he was wanted to see women promoted and the women wouldn't let him join because he wasn't a woman and those are the things that I want to see go away because what we want to do is get everybody fighting the fight for whichever level of diversity you're in we want everybody to bring along so the C CEOs, CIOs, whoever they are they're the ones who want the change but trying to get it down into you know the people below is where the difficulty is and that's where programs like this work I'm going to just jump in there and say, I don't get it. You know, these numbers, 80% of women marginalized by traditional career paths. McKinsey has been researching this for a decade now. The numbers are not changing. Um, and it's not mysterious. The, the point is, this is about organizational change management. So, and you've all done this. You can move to the cloud. Hello? If you can move to the cloud, you can create diverse leadership at the top. It's about having top-down buy-in, setting objectives, putting in your KPIs, and implementing. How hard is it? This is not rocket science. So what it means is, you know, beg the question. There's a lot of bias. This is about sexism. This is about <coughs> resistance to women in leadership, women in leadership in tech. So top-down objectives that the, the leadership is, is um, behind, money, you have to have the budget to make it happen, reward programs, uh, you know, whatever it takes. Um, if you're in that role, then you can do it. Very simple. Two, hire women. How hard is it? There's, you know, another, this is not rocket science. Vodafone has now put in, um, and they're, for best practices, check out what they're doing. But they have now um, publicly announced that they will fill 40% of open senior level roles with women from outside the company. So any woman, just hire her in. I have two silver bullets as well. There, you know, there are no silver bullets, but one is enforced paternity leave. So it's not a conversation, you have to take it. It becomes equal and normal. Yes, and there's, because the moment we can discuss it and whatever, then, you know, then it, it dilutes 
the outcome. There's too many social pressures otherwise to not do the right thing, so to speak. Um, better and more portrayal of girls and women in media. Role models for girls. This is a really hard thing. We don't see women in leadership. So that's for me about the messages to girls, but also the messages to women in leadership. You don't have to be a guy. You can be a woman and you can be all these other things. Um, and finally, you should be here. Um, white men pushing for gender and uh, diversity and inclusion actually get professional, um, professionally bootstrapped for yeah. that. Yeah. Us doing it is a professional dead end, you know, and I can tell you that from a personal level. So um, not only should you be here, just like she said, uh, you know, uh, he for she, whatever it is, but also it's um, a politically, professionally astute move. So more men speaking instead of us, uh, would be like for me an ideal outcome. And most men like working in mixed um, environments. You know, we both add to each other's work experience. Yeah. So, yeah. perfect. Yeah. So, I think we're near to time there. I don't know, if, Sasha, you wanted to say a quick word about the uh, We Power Tech program. Noel, if you perhaps give the mic to Sasha. Um, Sasha's reasonably new to the program, and uh, it'd be great to get a closing few lines on what the We Power Tech program is. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so my name is Sasha Thompson. I'm the inclusion marketing manager for Amazon Web Services. And I oversee the WePower Tech program, which is our diversity and inclusion outreach program. And it's doing things exactly like this. We partner with organizations that are around the world that are trying to get more women, more underrepresented groups, LGBTQ, whatever that um, diversity is, into tech. Um, we start from the smallest of small children all the way through working executives. So we want to make sure that there's a pipeline of diversity that is going through into the tech world. Um, for me, it's not a matter of working at AWS. We want these individuals working in the industry. And so that's why this is very important for us to continue having these conversations. So I want to just thank you all for coming today. And if you have any questions about the We Power Tech program, I definitely will be around um, later in the, at, at the reception as well. So thank, you. thank you. And thank you, Sasha, for bringing us here and getting this. And you so uh, thanks again to all the, the, the panel members for this afternoon and indeed for your participation throughout the day. Um, all that's left is to one final ask is to just give us uh, some feedback on the app for the speakers. We really do value your feedback and it helps us uh, create uh, future sessions uh, like this going forward. So if we can just take two minutes uh, before we go to drinks, uh, that'd be great and give us your, your feedback. So thanks again to all of the panelists and thank you for your attention throughout the day. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you back here at our next uh, summit again. Uh, uh, may not be in Brussels, but we'll certainly have another uh, public sector summit for Europe uh, in a location to be announced fairly soon. So thank awesome. you very much.